panelists to present some information progress. for you today, uh, mostly regarding the Omicron variant. A couple of housekeeping notes in advance here. We do have a couple of uh, all, uh, interpretation options. You can toggle those there on the bottom in the translation section. We have a Spanish translator and an American Sign Language translator on today's update. Uh, in the middle of the screen, you'll see a gray slider bar. You can use that to slide it to the left or to the right in order to customize your view for whatever purposes you need. And we'll go ahead here and introduce our panelists for today. We'll have Dr. Rachel Herlihy, the state epidemiologist at CDPHE, Rachel Jervis, epidemiologist at CDPHE, and Dr. Emily Trevanti, the state lab director at CDPHE. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and send things over to Dr. Herlihy to get things started. Great, thank you so much. Before we get into the Omicron variant, wanted to provide you with a quick update on case and hospitalization trends here in Colorado. Um, so this is a figure that shows us the daily case rates, case to case numbers with each of those gray vertical bars. And then the red line is showing you our seven day moving average number of cases in the state. So what you'll see if you look at the far right end of this figure is that we have seen a pretty dramatic decrease in the number of cases that we are reporting at this time. I think it's possible that this is, um, reflecting an improvement in transmission in Colorado. Um, but I think there's also the, the possibility that some of this is data aberration following the holiday. Um, we know that following holidays, there's often um, changes in individuals' behavior and seeking testing. There's changing in reporting patterns, changing in data entry patterns. And so all of that can lead to um, an underrepresentation of the true number of cases that are occurring. So we expect to see this data um, correct itself in the next week or so. Um, but until then, I think it's probably best to um, track most closely our hospitalization data. I think that data is much less likely to be biased by, by some of these trends um, in testing or reporting that happen over holiday weekends. So if we go to the next slide, we can talk about some of that hospitalization data. So here um, you can see the number of hospitalizations in Colorado over time. You can see that our most recent value is 1,466 hospitalizations, and that is the value for today. Um, you can see that we have also seen a decrease in hospitalizations along with our decrease in cases. And so this is certainly a, a good sign, um, though the decrease in hospitalizations that we're seeing right now is you know, less dramatic than the decrease in cases that we've seen. And, and so I do think it probably more accurately reflects a, a realistic picture of COVID-19 transmission in the state. Um, we know that hospitalization is really, data is going to be much less biased by, by those changes that might occur over holiday weekends. So again, we are seeing improvements in the data, um, certainly reassuring to see that things appear to be trending in the right direction. But always important to keep in mind too that following holidays, we do sometimes see um, increases in cases that occur um, following holiday gatherings and changes in interactions and contacts that people have. So that's certainly a possibility that we are preparing for. Um, we'll be watching the data closely to see if we do see a post um, Thanksgiving holiday surge in the state. Next slide. So moving on to the Omicron variant, wanted to share this data with you that shows um, the distribution of cases that have been identified across the globe at this point. You'll see that the closest cases to us here in the US uh, right now are in Canada where several cases have been identified, um, but really the focus of cases so far have been in Southern Africa, um, though a number of cases have also been identified in Europe, um, also cases in Australia. So um, at this point, there really are cases that are mostly related to travel at this point across the globe um, with most of the local transmission that's occurring, occurring in Southern Africa right now. Um, so at this point, no cases have been identified in the US and no cases have been identified in Colorado. Um, and we'll talk more about the detection systems that we have in place to ensure that um, here in Colorado, we can identify cases as early as possible when they do occur. Next slide. All right, so a little bit more background information about this variant. So this variant was first identified in South Africa on the 24th of November with the earliest collection date for specimens being in mid-November. Um, it was designated as a variant of concern or VOC by the World Health Organization on the 26th of November. Um, as I mentioned, the first samples were collected in mid-November. The earliest sample that I've seen um, is from November 9th. Um, and we have observed a, a really rapid increase in cases throughout provinces of South Africa, um, most notably in the province where, um, uh, sorry, it's Pretoria and Johannesburg are located. That's really where we've seen the greatest increase in local transmission so far. Um, multiple mutations across the genome in the spike protein alone um, for the virus. There are 30 known um, mutations that have occurred. 
we really at this point have a lot to learn about the Omicron variant. Um, but due to some of the mutations that are present, specifically in the spike protein of the virus, it is possible to, um, to make some predictions based on our understanding of similar uh, mutations that have been observed in other variants about what might be possible um, when it comes to characteristics of this particular variant. Um, so what we're learning is that it seems like this um, Omicron variant could potentially be more transmissible um, or that the immune response may, may not be as effective. And so these are characteristics that we're hoping to learn a little bit more about uh, as time goes on. Um, it could potentially be several weeks until we really have a good clinical picture, an epidemiologic picture of this variant. At this point, vaccination remains critically important, and experts at WHO have stated that they expect vaccines to remain an effective strategy against serious illness and death, similar to what we've seen with the Delta variant. Um, but again, many remaining questions, lots of questions right now about the spectrum of illness that is being seen with the Omicron variant. Uh, there have been anecdotal reports coming from clinicians in South Africa that have suggested that the cases appear to be mostly mild. Um, but at this point, the World Health Organization has urge some caution in interpreting that data, um, noting that a, a large number of the early infections have been among younger individuals who are probably more likely to have milder infections. Um, so again, we're waiting to get additional information um, about the spectrum of illness and more information about severity. Uh, South Africa has reported that they have seen an increase in COVID-19 associated hospitalizations, but it's difficult to know at this point if that is the expected number of hospitalizations for the number of cases that they're seeing or if that is more or fewer hospitalizations than you might expect. So again, I'm hoping to learn quite a bit more in the next couple of weeks. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Tavanti. Thank you, Dr. Hurley. Uh, so what are we doing right now to look for this Omicron variant in Colorado? I wanna underscore again that Omicron has not been detected in Colorado so far um, or in the United States as of 1.30 today. Um, in Colorado, we have three different um, ways in which we are currently on the lookout for this variant. First is our diagnostic testing. Colorado has a very large amount of diagnostic testing happening, and we do encourage anyone who has symptoms or has an exposure to seek testing. Um, we have over 140 community testing sites around the state um, that can be utilized by Coloradoans. We are also hearing that as with earlier variants, um, most of the common PCR tests and antigen tests on the market are expected to work with this variant, meaning that they will return a positive result for COVID-19 infection, even if a person were to be infected with Omicron. Many of the tests in Colorado, including here at the state laboratory, and a majority of our community testing vendors are using a test called the Thermo Fisher TACPATH combo test, which allows us to prioritize samples for sequencing based on the profile um, seen with this test. This test has three targets that it looks for in the COVID-19 genome, one of which is the spike target, which may or may not show up well for a Omicron variant, given that it contains deletions within this section. Any sample that has this spike drop profile is immediately forwarded on for clinical sequencing. We have updated clinical sequencing procedures to identify Omicron quickly in patient samples. We're doing sequencing here at the state laboratory and many of our commercial um, and community testing vendor partners are also performing sequence analysis. An additional way we can look for Omicron across Colorado is through wastewater sequence surveillance. This allows us to look for genetic markers indicative of variants within wastewater. Variants can be detected in wastewater sooner than in clinical samples, and the state lab has recently updated our processes and can now detect these markers in wastewater. I'd like to underscore that none have been detected yet. Next slide, please. So whole genome sequencing. Colorado has multiple sophisticated monitoring programs set up to detect the presence of variants in the state. The CDPHE laboratory and some private labs are currently conducting this sequencing on positive human samples for COVID-19. Colorado, we'd like to point out, Colorado ranks in the top 10% of states nationally for samples sequenced. And nearly all samples that have been sequenced since July have been the Delta variant. We have not confirmed any Omicron variant samples in Colorado, but both CDPHE lab and private labs are capable of detecting this variant through our whole, whole genome sequencing. And as I mentioned, this Omicron variant has the S-drop profile, which it shares in common with the Alpha variant, making it easier to detect. I would like to caution that the presence of an S-drop does not immediately mean that it has the Omicron variant, and we do want to wait till we have sequence confirmation before declaring presence of the Omicron variant. 
Um, the vast majority of samples in Colorado are now being forwarded on to this laboratory or others in order to sequence based on public health order 2033 that requests positive molecular test samples be submitted for sequencing. Next slide, please. So sequence analysis of Omicron from South Africa allows us to see that it has not been derived from Delta or other variants of concern. In fact, the closest evolutionary connection for this virus is with viruses that were circulating in mid-2020. The exact origin is not known, but the timeline here indicates that it was circulating for some time prior to detection. So in order to read this phylogenetic tree, if you read from the right to the, the left to the right, you can see over time the diversification of the virus. And these areas in the top of green is all of the Delta samples, which is what has been predominantly circulating globally. Um, and then most recently, you can see the detection here of the Omicron variant. Next slide, please. Colorado has an extensive variant sentinel surveillance program set up. This program captures an estimate of the variant prevalence across the state through whole genome sequencing of a random set of positive COVID-19 samples statewide. We have laboratories across the state submitting samples in for this sequencing program. And we can see here that beginning in July, the vast majority of sequences present here in Colorado have been the Delta variant. And that continues to be true today with about 99.9% .9 of our current sequences coming back as the Delta variant. Next slide, please. I'd like to turn it over now to Rachel Jervis. Thank you, Dr. Trivanti. So CDPHE leads the Colorado Wastewater Surveillance Collaborative. And since August of 2020, we have partnered with Colorado Wastewater Utilities and Colorado State University to monitor wastewater for COVID-19. Wastewater utilities can volunteer for this program and submit two samples per week. And currently we have 21 participating utilities. We test their water, wastewater samples for COVID-19 and look for genetic markers of variants. Wastewater monitoring is a COVID-19 early warning system. We've learned that almost 50% of people who have COVID will shed some virus in their stool regardless of whether or not they have symptoms. So we can use wastewater to identify the presence of a virus in a community before we may have results from clinical testing. It also includes individuals who may be asymptomatic or otherwise not seek or receive testing. Next slide. We believe that wastewater monitoring may detect Omicron before clinical samples. In fact, the Delta variant was detected in wastewater monitoring before clinical monitoring. We're fortunate that this technology is nimble and that state lab has already updated protocols to detect the genetic markers that are indicative of the Omicron variant. Um, our lab has completed the first round of testing since this protocol change. And as Dr. Travanti said before, there was no signature or genetic marker for the Omicron variant detected. I'll pass it back to Dr. Travanti now. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, so how is, how is waste sequencing from wastewater samples different from whole genome sequencing of clinical samples? When we sequence a clinical sample, we're looking at just the virus that's present in one single patient. Whereas with wastewater, we're looking at a pooled sample containing virus from multiple people, all in the same sample. This allows us to get a snapshot view of what might be circulating in a whole community. Next slide, please. Furthermore, while looking at the sequence from a clinical sample, we are looking at the entire virus from one person from start to finish in one complete um, full length sequence genome. While when we look at mutations in wastewater, we're looking at fragmented pieces of the virus from many people, which is represented here on this figure by the different um, colored bars, allowing us to detect mutations that are associated with variants under surveillance, such as alpha, delta, or omicron.
All right, thank you to everybody for presenting. We're going to move into the media Q&A portion of this afternoon's press conference. Uh, for the Q&A portion, we will be joined by Director Scott Bookman, COVID-19 Incident Commander, to join Dr. Herlihy, Rachel Jervis, and Dr. Trevanti. Uh, a couple of uh, notes here. We'll use the raise hand function. If you have a question, please raise your hand, and we'll get to people in the order that they, uh, if they raise their hands. Let's stick with first questions first, time allowing at the end. We can get some follow-ups or second questions so we can get to every everybody here. Please state your name and outlet before asking your question. And if you have any questions that were not covered in today's uh, media avail and uh, maybe outside of the scope, please email us at media underscore info at state.co.us and we'll be happy to get you some answers as soon as we can. Let's go ahead to Mark Craddock. Mark Craddock, are you there? Yes, I am. I'm sorry. This is Mark Craddock, the World Journal newspaper. And this is a bit a field of what this, what you've been talking about, but uh, uh, what's the status of the crisis standards of care given, you know, the hospital admissions and um, uh, shortages? And I've been told that parts of the standards of care are being rewritten. Is there anyone there who can speak to that? Uh, Mark, I'll take that question and uh, thank you all for joining today. You know, uh, I, top line, our crisis standards of care have not been activated. Um, while our hospitals are uh, seeing a high volume of COVID patients uh, and are certainly feeling the stress of this wave, uh, at this point in time, the crisis standards of care have not been activated in our hospitals. Uh, the GERC did meet last night to update our crisis standards of care, uh, simply because uh, we have been having conversations about uh, you know, what might be needed if uh, this wave continues to really stress our hospitals. Uh, and so the meeting last night was to evaluate the, the standards that had been put in place a year ago. Uh, we updated them and uh, they are ready if we need them. Uh, but at this point, the only crisis standard of care that has been activated is for staffing. Go ahead to John Frank, please. Hi, uh, John Frank at Axios here. I'm wondering if you're, what you make of the new mask mandates in the Denver metro area, if you're seeing uh, less compliance with those mandates and are worried at all about that, given you know, the number of complaints that are coming forward and just you know, the fatigue that we've talked about on this call uh, in prior weeks. Thank you. Um, you know, I think first and foremost, um, we're all tired of COVID. Uh, that is the reality of the situation at this point. Um, but COVID is not done with us. And it is absolutely critical that we all continue to take the precautions that are necessary to protect the capacity of our healthcare system and to protect each other. One of those precautions is wearing a mask. Uh, another precaution is uh, you know staying home when you're sick and getting tested. And most importantly, getting the safe and effective vaccine, whether it's your first dose, your second dose, or your booster, that is the ticket out of this pandemic. I want to commend uh, Denver and other jurisdictions that have taken the step of uh, moving forward with the mask mandate that they felt was appropriate for their jurisdiction. Uh, but really, what I want to just reiterate to, to all Coloradans is that we are still in this together. Uh, and the safest thing, the best thing that you can do, get that vaccine, wear a mask when you're indoors. Let's take care of each other and get through this. All right, let's go ahead to Seth Klayman. Hi guys, uh, Seth from the Gazette. Just overall with the caveats, you know, about how much we don't know about this new variant, what level of concern should the public have right now? Obviously there's, there's a lot of information flowing out. Um, so what, how concerned should the public be right now? Thanks. Yeah, so I think the reality is that we do have a lot to learn still. Um, the mutations that we're seeing are allowing us to infer that some of the characteristics we could potentially expect to see with the Omicron variant are going to be increased transmissibility and then potentially some level of the immune system being evaded. And so that can mean potentially um, reinfection. I think that is certainly going to be a, a possibility that could occur here and is obviously something that we're, we're waiting for more information from South Africa 
on. Um, as far as increased transmissibility, we do have experience with the Delta variant. So the Delta, Delta variant was more transmissible when it arrived than previous variants had been. And, and what we learned from that was that these more transmissible variants are even more efficient at finding individuals that are unvaccinated and at risk. And, and so I think the takeaway here is that individuals who are unvaccinated, whether they've been previously infected or not, um, are going to continue to be at high risk, um, probably higher risk than they have been since the beginning of the pandemic. All right, let's go over to Liz. Hi, this is Liz Gilardi with Denver 7 News. I also had a question uh, regarding the masking um, orders that we're seeing in place. And I think, um, you know, previously one of the reporters had alluded to the fact that maybe we aren't seeing as much compliance, but I'm also wondering if we could see a statewide mask mandate um, in light of the new variant, especially if it is more transmissible. Yeah, the, we still have a lot to learn about Omicron, um, but what we continue to see is a variable spread of disease across our state. Uh, and we know that at this point in the pandemic, a single set of orders across the state uh, is unlikely to be an effective technique. Uh, and so we are continuing to work with our local public health partners, our local elected officials uh, to, to work through the right strategies for each community. Uh, and this team here uh, will be continuing to learn all that we can about this new variant and any other new variants that uh, come up. Uh, to make sure that we are providing our local partners with all the information that they need. All right, let's go to Steve Steger. Hello, thank you. Uh, Steve Steger from Nine News. One question for Rachel, and it kind of piggybacks on a, another question that we've had or that was asked already. Um, we as the public, we keep seeing headlines about Omicron. It's all over the place. Should we as the public be paying as much attention to the specific variant that's out there right now, or should we leave it up to you guys for a little while until more is known? Because I keep hearing that we don't know a lot about it. And a question for Emily, um, it, through your sequencing, this, this may be the stupidest question in the world, but does the original COVID variant still exist? Like the thing that got this whole thing kickstarted or is it just gone? Um, so I can start. So, I mean, I think, what we have, and I think what the public needs to know is that the strategies that we used for Alpha are the same strategies that we're using now for Delta and the same strategies that we will use for Omicron when it arrives in Colorado and the US. Um, it's the same things that we've been doing that we've thankfully learned how to do now to try and suppress transmission. So obviously most important is going to be vaccination and the vaccination for our children. A lot of the cases that have been um, reported in South Africa have been among younger individuals. And so I think that does reinforce the importance of vaccination for all Coloradans, but but now, especially for our five to 11 year olds who are newly eligible for vaccine. I think also um, reinforces the importance of booster doses, knowing that there could be some greater level of immune evasion. Um, I think that's another reason um, for individuals to consider getting booster doses at this time to have that highest level of antibody or immune protection um, when a potential exposure does occur for, for an individual. Um, and then it's all of the other things that we've been doing. So wearing masks indoors obviously continues to be incredibly important, um, not just for Omicron um, arriving in Colorado or the US in the near future, um, but also for Delta. Um, we know that we have very high rates of transmission across the state right now. And so masks are an important strategy. Same thing with physical distancing, limiting the size of gatherings, hand washing, all of those things that we've been doing for, for many months now. So to, to address the question about, you know, is the original virus gone? I think that's a little bit difficult to say. This virus, you know, it makes many, many copies of itself within a host as it replicates and, and transmits to the next person. And every time it makes a copy of itself, it can, um, it can have an error in that copying process, which leads to mutation. Um, if that mutation is something that is advantageous, it may become, you know, a fixed mutation. And, and that's how we see new variants coming out. That's what we saw with the, you know, first alpha and then um, delta and now uh, Omicron, Omicron, excuse me. Um, but, you know, I think the interesting thing is that when we look back at the, the first sequences of this new variant and look at its nearest neighbors in the databases of sequences that are happening across the entire world, its nearest neighbors were, you know, circulating back in, in mid-2020, which um, tells us that 
there there is sequence you know sequence out there that we don't we don't have in the database. You know, there's there's the virus from every single infection is not sequenced, so we don't know everything that's out there. But we do know that the vast majority of what's out there right now, particularly in Colorado, is Delta. Um, Delta is highly transmissible. Um, and so it, it continues to be um, the virus that is, you know, most likely to be passed from person to person here in in Colorado and, and much of the U.S. at this point. Um, it remains to be seen if the transmissibility of Omicron will be um, at the same level as Delta, and you know, we'll watch that over time. Um, but we we do continue still to see some of the alpha variants and, and other variants out there um, in the database as well across the, the U.S. and globally. And you know we are a global society, so whatever we see in one part of the world easily um, moves moves across um, borders to other parts. Let's Thank go you. to Connor McHugh. Hello, Connor from CBS4 here. Uh, you guys have touched on this a little bit in some of your answers about how this will require some of the same strategies. But if if you guys do find in the coming weeks that this does have higher levels of vaccine resistance or transmissibility, are there any additional safety measures that can be considered outside of the ones that uh, you guys are already urging the public to take. So without, I mean, I think there's a lot of speculation that could be done here um, at this point. I mean, I think the tools that we have now are the tools that we are looking to, um, you know, I think using the public health strategies and the individual strategies that we've been using are um, what are more likely or most likely to be effective going forward. Um, we know that the vaccine manufacturers and the antiviral manufacturers are so, certainly going to be paying close attention to um, vaccine effectiveness and antiviral effectiveness. Um, and they have already talked about the fact that they could make changes if changes would be needed. Um, but again, that's a lot of speculation. And I think we first need to really understand um, this virus and the characteristics of this virus before we jump ahead to, to new strategies. All right, let's go to Gabrielle Franklin. Hey, this is Gabrielle from Fox 31 here. Um, just had a quick question about kids and COVID in the state. So the state is reporting a good response from kids five to 11 getting the vaccine. Uh, more than 20% already got a dose, yet state data shows that schools are still the leading source of outbreak in Colorado. So I just wanted to know why is that and what can we be doing to sort of slow these school cases down as we see the new variant emerging? Scott, do you want to start with pediatric vaccination rates so I can jump into school transmission? Sure. Uh, you know, it's still early. Uh, we are, you know, only about three and a half weeks in now to our uh, pediatric vaccine campaign. Uh, you know, Colorado should be incredibly proud right now. Uh, the last data that we saw, we were 10th in the nation uh, for our rates of uh, pediatric vaccination. Uh, that's uh, our 5 to 11 year olds with 20% having received their first dose. Uh, and those numbers continue to, to increase. Uh, we've had great partners at our local public health, our, our providers, uh, our hospitals, our pharmacies, and then these great partnerships at the zoo and, and museums, uh, making this a, a warm and inviting and safe environment for our, our kids to get vaccinated. Obviously, uh, the full efficacy of that vaccine will take a while to manifest itself in our data. Uh, and so while we're making great progress here, uh, we're not quite there yet. And so I think Dr. Hurley, he can then speak to you know what we're seeing now, uh, knowing that uh, th those vaccination rates will kick in soon. Yes, so for many weeks now, we have seen the highest rates of transmission of COVID-19 occurring among our school-aged population, specifically that population that until recently was too young to be vaccinated. And, and we believe that's really because that's where the lowest level of immunity was when you look at immunity by age groups. And so that was the greatest, um, that's the population that's been the most susceptible. And that's obviously very different from the beginning of the pandemic, where we really saw much lower rates occurring among children. Um, and so as Scott mentioned, as we see the immunity level go up in our school-aged children, we do expect to see that infection rate drop in that population. And I think it, it goes back to, to what I said earlier about the, the Delta variant um, being highly efficient at really finding individuals that are unvaccinated, whether those individuals were unvaccinated as adults by choice, or if those individuals are, are children who had until recently been too young to be vaccinated. 
And uh, let me correct my previous statement. We are now eighth in the nation for our pediatric vaccination rates. Uh, we were 10th a couple of days ago. I didn't have the, the freshest data in front of me, so I apologize. Eighth in the nation. All right, let's go to Michael Deuara. Yeah, Michael Deuara with uh, KUNT Public Radio. And uh, I guess this is a question for Dr. Herlihy. Um, we don't have uh, Omicron virus in Colorado yet that we know of, um, but it seems um, just based on this conversation that it will be coming. Do you have any idea when? Yeah, difficult to know when. So at this point, we're really using all the tools we have, um, as Dr. Travanti explained, to make sure we have the detection systems in place to identify it as quickly as possible uh, once it is here. Um, and at the same time, we are also working on the epidemiologic side with our epidemiology teams to make sure that we are standing up um, procedures um, for responding, case investigation, contact tracing, um, enhanced traveler monitoring for individuals that have um, come from countries where the infection is spreading more readily um, to make sure we have all of those systems in place and that we're ready to respond. Let's go to Seth. I, uh, Seth McZed again. Dr. Girani, I think this is probably for you. Um, given the detection systems you laid out a few minutes ago, do you think that's sufficient to track the variant as you know when it inevitably gets here, um, or do you foresee that any of those systems need, needing to be stepped up in some capacity? And and is that even possible beyond you know what's already happening? Thanks. We, we do think we have a very high level of sequence surveillance happening here in Colorado. Um, sequencing that's done here in the state laboratory, as well as our clinical partners, and in conjunction with the CDC, is leading us to be 10th um, uh, in the country at this point for um, or over 10% of our stuff is being sequenced at this point. I got that number wrong, excuse me. Um, and you know, I, we continue to ensure that we are getting samples in from all across the state and make sure that we are seeing a subsampling of everything that's happening out in the environment. So I am confident that um, through both the clinical sequencing as well as this early morning system with the wastewater sequencing, that we are able to um, see, see Omicron when it does um, appear in Colorado. All right, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon for our COVID-19 media update. If you have any questions that we were not able to get to or that were not covered in today's press conference, please feel free to email us at media underscore info at state.co.us and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Thanks a bunch, have a good afternoon.